Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, last night, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde cancelled thousands of procedures. We know the SNP's flagship Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is already the worst performing in the country. And this morning, there are reports of nurses at the hospital working 24-hour shifts. It's disgraceful to put NHS staff in that situation. And despite their incredible efforts, it could be harmful to patients. A whistleblower has said this, their words, we are struggling to cope. In short, we are struggling to provide first world care in what feels like a third world environment. Given this, how can the First Minister say the Health Secretary has done all he can to support NHS staff and prepare for this crisis? First Minister. Firstly, uh, Presiding Officer, in relation to reports in the media this morning about staff in Greater Glasgow and Clyde being asked to work 24-hour shifts, uh, that, as I am assured uh, by NHS Greater and Glasgow and Clyde, and as the Board has said publicly, is not true. Uh, let me just quote NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, there is absolutely no truth to these claims. Uh, the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde does not ask nursing staff to work a 24-hour shift, and there was no prospect that any staff member would need to work for 24 hours. To suggest otherwise uh, is inaccurate and misleading. Uh, and I uh, would not expect any health board to request uh, any member of staff to do that. Uh, secondly, presiding officer, staff across the National Health Service in Scotland, indeed staff across the National Health Services in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, are struggling right now. They're doing an extraordinary and a magnificent job, uh, and my heartfelt thanks go to all of them. Uh, but they are struggling in the face of unprecedented pressure on our National Health Service, uh, pressure from COVID, uh, even more so in recent weeks from flu and, of course, from other respiratory uh, illnesses. We hope that pressure will abate in the weeks to come. But in the meantime, uh, the government continues to do everything possible to support uh, NHS boards as they address those pressures. Now, lastly, presenting officer, in relation to the announcement from Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, last night, uh, as I said on Monday, uh, we have empowered NHS boards to take action that they think is appropriate to protect critical and life-saving care. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has paused non-urgent elective procedures in order that they can prioritise urgent treatment and cancer care, and I would expect that to be for a very short period. And uh, finally, uh, this is my final point, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it insults people's intelligence to suggest that the problems being encountered in the NHS in Scotland, which are the same as the problems being encountered elsewhere, uh, are somehow down to uh, the Health Secretary. Uh, is it, for example, uh, the fault of Humza uh, Yousaf that the kind of action uh, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde announced last night has also been taken in health services in South London, in Surrey, in York, Scarborough, in Derby, in Leicester, in Nottingham, in Southampton and in Portsmouth, and I probably could uh, go on. These are unprecedented pressures which we continue to support our NHS to address. Douglas Ross. How can nationalist MSPs actually clap such a despicable answer from Scotland's First Minister in Scotland's Parliament about Scotland's National Health Service? So let's ignore the nationalist MSPs. Let's look at what medical professionals, let's look at what medical professionals are saying. They are damning about this government's response to this crisis here in Scotland. On Monday, the First Minister placed some of the blame for the grave situation in A&E departments on, in her own words, unnecessary attendances. But Dr Leila Peel, Deputy Chair of BMA Scotland, criticised patient blaming language, saying, and these are her words, it shows a lack of understanding of the current crisis. We've analysed the figures and Dr Peel is spot on. There are actually fewer people in A&E now than there were in the years leading up to the COVID pandemic. The problem is not unnecessary attendances. 
Fewer people attended a and &E in the first week of this year than they did in 2020, 2019, 2018 or 2017. So will the First Minister accept that the blame lies with her government and not the patients? Yeah. First Minister, um, nobody, uh, including me, uh, certainly uh, not me, is blaming uh, patients. It is the case. Well, let's hear the First Minister. Thank you. Unnecessary uh, 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 visits to accident and emergency, uh, unnecessary attendances and admissions to hospital are not in the interests of patients. That's why we are working hard to make sure that where patients can be and should be treated elsewhere, that happens. Now, let me just take. Uh, the, the points made by Douglas Ross in turn and let's look in detail at uh, demand uh, and why the figures that he has quoted uh, are actually uh, the case. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that demand on our health service right now is higher uh, than it has been for some time. If we look at calls to NHS 24 over the festive period, the highest demand in a decade. If we look at emergency calls to the Scottish Ambulance Service, higher uh, in the most recent week than the average of the four weeks before that. The reason that they are not all translating into attendances at accident emergency or admissions to hospital is because of the work NHS 24 exactly. and the Scottish Ambulance Service Absolutely. are doing to avoid that. Uh, so the NHS 24 uh, now provides advice and where necessary treatment uh, to the vast majority of patients during the initial call that they make. Uh, in terms of the ambulance service, most of the calls to the ambulance service um, are treated through see and treat, uh, so they are not, the patients are not taken to hospital. But those, because of that, those who do go to hospital tend to be sicker yep. and their length of stay is longer. That is part of the reason we have pressure yep. uh, on yep. our yep. hospitals. And uh, the waiting times in E&E, &E, of course, are a reflection uh, of the fact that occupancy in our hospitals are so high, which is why we are focused uh, on speeding up discharge from hospital where appropriate. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, uh, we listen very carefully to engage with, work with health professionals each and every single day. Um, and uh, it would be hard for me to find uh, the words appropriate to describe uh, my respect for our health professionals. Uh, but of course, elsewhere in the UK this week, we've seen health professionals First Minister. on strike. Yeah. They've not yeah. been on strike yeah. in Scotland yeah. because of the work this health secretary has done and because of the respect that we have for our health care professionals. Douglas Ross. Uh, I I think those words may come back to haunt the, the First Minister, but, you know, if, if we're judging Cabinet Secretaries on sector striking, I would hate to be Shirley Ann Somerville right now, I've got to say that. Uh, and, and we've just heard it. The First Minister is doubling down on her patient-blaming language. The problem is not too many people attending A&E. The problem is this government's handling of the NHS crisis here in Scotland. Dr Peel said exit block is the problem in A&E &E. and the government have known this has been a huge issue for years. The First Minister was defending her uh, position in the last answer by saying people uh, are getting sicker but people healthy and ready to go home can't get out of hospital because the First Minister and her government haven't dealt with bed blocking. Mm -hmm. They were failing to tackle this before the Covid pandemic and now it's worse than ever. New reports today state that the number of avoidable deaths is now 60 people a week in Scotland. Shocking. That's 60 families across our country grieving every single week the loss of a loved one who could have been saved. So, First Minister, will you confirm those tragic figures? First Minister. What I will absolutely confirm is that uh, when people wait too long for treatment, uh, that has severe consequences potentially for patients. That is why we work so hard uh, and will continue to work so hard with the health service uh, to reduce long waits uh, for treatment, whether that's an accident emergency or uh, whether it is for elective care 
on our National Health Service. Now, um, I wasn't, to use Douglas Ross's phrase, doubling down uh, on anything. Uh, and I certainly, for the avoidance of any doubt, I am not blaming patients for anything. It is in the interests of patients yep. to make sure that, where appropriate, they can be treated outside of hospital. Because it's not in the interest of any patient to end up in an accident emergency unit or in a hospital ward uh, just because uh, treatment is not available in the community. What I was doing uh, was trying to, uh, because it's obvious from his questions that Douglas Ross doesn't understand this, uh, explain the flow of patients through our National Health Service uh, and why we see longer waits in accident emergency. It's because of over-occupancy in our hospital wards. And finally, uh, on the exit block, uh, the significant chunk of what I and the Health Secretary set out on Monday was about tackling delayed discharges. Now, we uh, understand uh, from our daily engagement with Let's health hear boards the First Minister, that we please. have seen delayed discharges uh, reduce slightly in recent weeks. Uh, but there is much more to do. Uh, so that was the reason for the interventions and the additional funding that yeah. I indicated on Monday and the Health Secretary set out to the Chamber on Tuesday. So we will continue to be focused um, on providing the support and making the interventions that are necessary right now uh, to help the NHS during this period of unprecedented demand. Uh, and let me remind Douglas Ross and the Chamber, unprecedented demand that has been faced not just in Scotland, uh, but all over the UK and indeed in much of the rest of the world as well. Douglas Ross. The First Minister can throw insults at me if she wants. I was quoting a... Well, she laughs at this. You can laugh at that, First Minister, if you want, but Through I was chair, quoting please. a frontline doctor in Scotland's NHS who happens to be the Deputy Chair of the BME uh, in Scotland. Uh, but the First Minister effectively confirmed those tragic figures we heard this morning are correct. 60 avoidable deaths every single week in Scotland's NHS, confirmed by Scotland's First Minister. And Scotland's Health Secretary is making the situation worse, not better. Here's just one example of what we're experiencing across Scotland. On Hogmanay, a family visited their 80-year-old uncle. He's had major heart surgery, hip operations, and often struggles to breathe. When they arrived, they discovered he'd fallen and broken his neck. The family dialed 999 seven times, and it took more than 12 and a half hours for the ambulance to arrive. Seven emergency calls, 12 and a half hours for an 80 year old who had broken their neck. His niece told us the ambulance crews were brilliant, but we are disgusted at what our uncle has been put through. This dire situation confirms yet again this Health Secretary and this Government is not on top of this crisis. His failures are creating risk to lives across the country. First Minister, surely for the good of Scotland, it's time to sack Hamza Youssef. First Minister. If I, if I raised a, a smile in response to Douglas Ross, it was not directed at any health professional. I suppose what I was raising a smile about in very challenging circumstances for everybody right now is Douglas Ross accusing anybody else of insults. Uh, I think yeah. that is... Yeah. I, every single day with the Health Secretary, will continue to take the actions that are necessary to support our NHS during these very difficult times. Um, I said earlier on, and I, I don't take anything for granted, and I am not uh, intending to sound complacent at all uh, about this, but it's because we respect so highly those who work in the front line of our National Health Service that uh, we are offering them right now a much higher pay increase for next year than any other government anywhere else in the UK. And thus far, uh, we have avoided uh, industrial action in our National Health Service, and we will continue to do everything we can uh, to make sure that that continues. Uh, we're also supporting health boards uh, to address the reasons uh, for long waits in our National Health Service, whether that is waits for an ambulance 
or waits in accident emergency or long waits to be discharged from hospital. That's why we announced the action that we did earlier this week. Uh, there are too many patients right now waiting too long for treatment and we will continue to do everything we can to address that while we hope these pressures caused by COVID and by flu in the main abate over the weeks to come. But that should not take away from the fact, and this is true in the ambulance service, it is true in our accident and emergency units, it's true in our GP practices, it's true across our hospitals and other healthcare settings. The vast majority of patients in this country, even during these extreme extremely difficult times get excellent care on our National Health Absolutely. Service and that is down to the dedication of those who work in it and that's why they have my grateful thanks each and every single day. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Bring up, sir, yesterday Jackie Bailey and I hosted a health summit with frontline NHS staff, representative organisations and experts working across our NHS. They told us that our NHS is broken and the system is failing that they are being asked to do the impossible and that every day this crisis puts patients' lives at risk. And they were united in telling us that the cause of this crisis is not COVID, is not the flu, is not strep A and is not winter pressures. They say that this is a crisis that is 10 years in the making. But the First Minister does not agree. So why does she think frontline NHS staff are wrong? First Minister. I don't uh, think frontline health service staff are wrong in what they say, um, but I, I do think I, I don't know why it took until yesterday for Anna Sarwar and Jackie Bailey to meet with yeah. uh, health service professionals. Yeah. Uh, the health secretary meets with them uh, regularly, and I have engagements. Thank you. As well. You, you probably never met them. But what? What health service professionals say to us, what I'm sure they said uh, to Anna Sarwar uh, yesterday, is yes, there were pre-existing challenges in our National Health Service that uh, go before COVID. Uh, we were taking action to address those. So if you look at funding in our National Health Service, uh, frontline health funding has more than doubled under this government. It's higher per head of population than it is in other parts of the UK. There are almost 30,000 more people working in our National Health Service today than when this government took office. Uh, more healthcare professionals, whether that's doctors, qualified nurses, or across a range of uh, different professional groups than there are per head of population in other parts of the UK. Uh, so we will continue to work with frontline healthcare professionals to deal with these challenges. But what I do take issue with Anna Sarwar on um, is that somehow it is not the case that COVID and flu uh, is having a very significant impact on these pressures. Uh, there are right now over 1,200 uh, patients with COVID in our hospitals. Uh, anybody who says that is not having an impact on what we're dealing with right now, it uh, frankly is not dealing in reality. Yeah. In uh, the couple of weeks, I think, uh, leading up to Christmas or over the Christmas period, there were 1,000 patients a week with flu admitted to our hospitals. Uh, anybody who says that is not a significant factor in what we're dealing with right now is frankly not dealing in reality. And that's a, a comment directed at Anna Sarwar, not at healthcare professionals who are dealing with these issues each and every day. So whether it's on NHS pay, whether it's on record Briefly, First Minister, record staffing numbers, we'll continue to support the NHS during these difficult times, as we always have done. Anna Sarwar. I think it's pretty clear from that answer who's not dealing with reality, and it's Nicola Sturgeon and her SNP government. She might not want to listen to me, but she should listen to the organisations. The Royal College of Nursing, the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Royal College of Surgeons of, Ed of Edinburgh, the Royal College of General Practitioners, Glasgow Local Medical Committee, the British Medical Association in Scotland, Unison, GMB, Unite, all saying they've heard the excuses before, they don't believe it, and they think the First Minister is not doing enough. Because the sticky plaster approach will not solve the problem. We heard directly from staff about the impact that this crisis is having on them. They told us, in their words, that this is causing them moral injury. That is personal distress and trauma because they can't provide the care they know their patients need. Psychological and mental trauma for our NHS staff. One of them said, that the conditions they were working in meant no dignity, no respect, no safety for patients. And the BME and the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have both said in stark terms that this crisis is leading to avoidable deaths. And they predict that could be as many as 60 avoidable deaths a week. The experts tell us that what was announced this week will not be enough to address the problem. 
So why can't the First Minister see that her sticky plaster approach is not working? First Minister. We will continue to take a range of actions. What we announced this week uh, was in addition to the actions already being taken and of course the record investment uh, that we are putting into our National Health Service in the next financial year, uh, supported by the, the tax decisions we are taking, asking those who can most afford it to pay a bit more in tax. We will see an additional billion pounds going into our National Health Service. So we will support investment and where it is appropriate and in the interest of patients, we will support reform uh, in care and patient pathways within our National Health Service. Uh, nothing Anna Sarwar has said to me uh, today hasn't already been said uh, directly to government by healthcare professionals because we engage uh, day in and day out with them. They are dealing uh, with unprecedented pressures uh, right now. Uh, some of that does necessitate longer term reform in our National Health Service, but some of that uh, is absolutely being caused by the winter pressures that have been at their peak in recent weeks. I would hope uh, that over uh, the, the coming weeks and very soon we will start to see flu levels uh, reduce significantly, for example, and that will start to reduce some of that pressure on our hospitals. I, I think the situation uh, with COVID remains more unpredictable and volatile, uh, given new variants uh, that are circulating. So I hope we will see some of this pressure abate, but that will still leave a challenging situation in our health service, which is why the investment, uh, the increase in staffing and the reforms continue to be so important. No government anywhere uh, has a, a single solution to this right now, but this government remains focused on taking the actions that are necessary, which is why I think we do continue uh, to have the trust of the people of Scotland as we do so. Anna Sarwar. The First Minister is just not listening. The First Minister is just not listening and the approach is not working. This is not just a crisis in winter. This is a crisis that's all year round. And Nicola Sturgeon's excuses won't wash. The crisis in our NHS is not because of COVID. It's not because of flu. It's not because of strep A. It's not winter pressures. This is a crisis 15 years in the making. And the result, the longest ever NHS waiting list, 750,000 Scots waiting. The worst ever a &E waiting times, 2,000 people a week waiting more than 12 hours. Record levels of delayed discharge, 58,501 NHS bed days lost a month as a result. After 15 years of the SNP, our NHS is broken and the system is failing. Staff are being asked to do the impossible and patients are being asked to accept the unacceptable. Lives are being lost. Isn't it the case that the people that caused the problem can't be the ones to fix the problem? First Minister. On the latter point, that is, of course, uh, always up to the people of, of Scotland, uh, who they trust to be in government uh, to lead the country uh, through challenges. Um, of course, there were challenges in our health service before uh, COVID. Uh, I have never sought to suggest otherwise. Um, and the actions we were taking around investment, staffing, reforms to patient pathways um, are designed to address that. There are record numbers uh, of staff in our health service right now, almost 30,000 more uh, than when this government took office. And, uh, of course, more staff per head of population than anywhere else in the UK. That is the reality. But I think people watching at home, uh, listening to Anna Sarwar, the, you know, around one in 25 of the Scottish population that have COVID uh, right now, the many people watching at home who will be suffering from flu and other respiratory illnesses right now, to hear Anna Sarwar say that uh, the fact that we've got 1,200 COVID patients uh, in our hospitals uh, right now, or that 1,000 uh, patients with flu have been admitted a week in recent times to our hospitals, to hear Anna Sarwar say uh, that has got nothing to do with the pressures in our NHS, Yes, will wonder what on earth Anna Sarwar yeah, is talking yeah, about. Uh, so we will continue to work with, listen to uh, those on the front line of our National Health Service as we uh, continue to strive to give them fair pay increases and as we continue to support them to deliver excellent care, as even during these tough times, they continue to do for the vast majority of patients yeah. across our country. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Do you ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole-Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. My opposition colleagues are quite right to raise the crisis in our NHS. And Liberal Democrat research has quantified just how bad things are. Last year, 
we discovered that one in six people who couldn't get a GP appointment actually carried out a medical procedure on themselves or got somebody else to do it. Presiding officer, Maria is 22 years old. She is a Ukrainian refugee who has been living in Scotland since the summer. She suffers from a hormonal thyroid condition which requires regular testing and treatment. But when she presented to her new GP, she was faced with an unexpected dilemma. The wait was so long that it actually made more sense for her to risk travelling back to a war zone to see her doctor in Kyiv. And so she did. Presiding officer, the air raid sirens, the drone strikes and cruise missile attacks of the Ukrainian capital were less daunting to Maria than the wait for treatment in Scotland's NHS. That is appalling. These are the risks that people are taking for the sake of their own health and all for the want of basic access to primary care. So can I ask the First Minister, is she embarrassed by this? First Minister. Um, I, I don't know the circumstances beyond what uh, Alex Cole Hamilton has narrated of that case and it would be wrong for me to comment on an individual uh, case. What I do know is that we again continue to support uh, general practice. There are more uh, GPs uh, per head of population in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. 83 GPs per 100,000 population here uh, compared to 63 in England, uh, 63 in Wales, 75 in Northern Ireland. Uh, we of course have a target that we uh, are right now working uh, towards delivery of increased numbers of GPs. We've recruited I think more than 3,000 members of the wider multidisciplinary teams in general practice and primary care. Uh, access to GPs like access to other parts of the health service right now are challenging and very challenging for some patients and we continue to work to address that and we will continue to do that with record investment, record support for recruitment and in partnership with those working so hard across our health service. Question number four, Fiona Hislop. To ask the First Minister what the implications for Scotland and the Scottish Government are following Met our office reports that temperatures in Scotland and the UK reached the highest on record in 2022. First Minister. <coughs> The Met Office figures underline that we are already experiencing climate change impacts in Scotland. Uh, we must adapt to these changes and prepare for further impacts of global climate change, uh, which of course are already locked in. Uh, we are currently preparing the third climate change adaptation programme for publication next year to succeed uh, the current programme. These programmes respond to the UK climate change risk assessments, which present the best available evidence and climate projections from organisations across the UK, including of course the Met Office. The climate the Change Committee has urged that risks from higher temperatures be prioritised in the upcoming programme and we're working across government and with public bodies to ensure improved preparedness for a projected increase in hotter years in future. Fiona Hislop. Uh, these figures are indeed alarming and across the world... We will have a brief suspension. Okay, thank you, uh, members. We will resume, and I call Fiona Hislop. So these record temperature figures are indeed alarming. And across the world, we're seeing more extreme weather experiences with increased flooding and extreme heat at home. And every government bears acute responsibilities to tackle this climate emergency. With the draft Scottish Government Energy Strategy published this week and the Climate uh, Change Committee's critical report published in December, does the First Minister acknowledge that this government now needs to accelerate actual delivery on housing and transport emission reductions and a just transition to renewable energy? And will she ensure the government's budget is sufficient and that public bodies ramp up on delivery as on current trends we won't be meeting? are ambitious net zero targets.
First Minister. I absolutely agree with Fiona Hislop on all of that. It is worth uh, pointing out, of course, that the energy strategy published this week uh, with the Just Transition vision alongside that uh, was in part about uh, how we accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels in a fair uh, and just manner uh, to renewable and low-carbon sources of energy. And I think that is uh, really important. We must remain uh, focused 100 per cent on delivering uh, our policy programme across the whole uh, of society. That includes transport um, and the heating of homes. Uh, we have to decarbonise the energy system, as I've just uh, said, and the draft energy strategy goes into detail about how we do that. We must make sure the climate change plan reflects uh, all of that. A draft of that will be published later this year uh, alongside sectoral just transition plans uh, setting out a clear path for emissions reductions uh, and of course we need to make sure the investment is in place to back all of that up uh, so this is something uh, that the government remains focused on we often talk about it in terms of a challenge and much of it is challenging but in all of this there is also massive massive opportunities for scotland that we must seize Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. By 2050, there could be well over 100 heat-related deaths a year, according to the UK Climate Change Committee. Adapting buildings for cooling will be key to avoiding a worst-case scenario, and I welcome the joint work with the UK Government on this. So can the First Minister confirm when an assessment will be ready of the cooling systems required for current housing stock? First Minister. Um, on uh, the, the question of when an assessment will be ready, I'll come back to the member uh, with a precise answer uh, on that. But I absolutely agree with them that this is an important strand of work. Uh, how we decarbonise heat in our buildings uh, and the, the cooling of buildings is incredibly uh, important as a part of the overall delivery of our climate change objectives. So we will continue to work uh, where necessary in partnership uh, with the UK government because some of the levers and powers uh, lie with the UK government. I'll be seeing the Prime Minister uh, later this evening and I'm sure these issues will be uh, one of many issues uh, that we touch upon. So uh, these are all important. Uh, I'm sure we'll debate all of these issues, the detail of them robustly in this chamber, but I also hope there will be a lot that unites us um, as we live up to the responsibility on our shoulders to help combat the climate emergency. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, for what reason two ferries, which will serve Isla, are being built in Turkey? First Minister. In line with relevant procurement legislation, the ferries currently being built for service on the Isla routes were awarded following a full and open tendering process led by SEMA, which of course is the procuring authority. Uh, the bid received from the Shard represented the best value for money in terms of quality and price. Liam Kerr. Thank the First Minister for that answer, but the Climate Change Committee's report last month wasn't just critical, it was devastating in exposing this government's failures on the environment and emissions. So is the First Minister comfortable that the steel for these two ferries is coming not from a Scottish steel mill, there's one around 40 miles from here, for example, but rather from China, the world's largest polluter whose steel sector is the second largest contributor to its emissions? First Minister. Well, firstly, on the, the procurement decisions, uh, you know, it's over recent weeks, uh, the leader of the Member's Party has uh, questioned me in this chamber, rightly so, and uh, seemed to suggest that somehow we hadn't followed uh, proper procurement policies uh, in the award of other ferry contracts. So it's really important uh, to stress that in all of these matters, uh, we comply with relevant procurement legislation. In terms of uh, the steel, uh, of course, these are, uh, that is a, a matter for the company uh, that has the contract. Uh, the contract awarded as a standard international shipbuilding contract and and as such, the decision regarding materials and equipment lies with the shipyard. However, I understand that the shipyard uh, may originally have intended to source steel from uh, Ukraine, but obviously have had to look uh, elsewhere. So these are decisions that the shipyard uh, will take, um, and I'm sure they will apply uh, all necessary uh, objectives to the decisions that they reach. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. These two new ferries will each be able to carry up to 450 passengers and 100 cars or 14 commercial vehicles, giving a combined 40% increase in vehicle and freight capacity on the Isla route. This represents an improvement for islanders and businesses, 
and underlines the Scottish Government's commitment to our island communities and the ferry network. Does the First Minister share my view that questions like the one we have just heard reiterate the fact that the Tories are interested in politicking and not people when it comes to the ferry network? First Minister. Well, I I think Jenny Minto on that last point is absolutely right, uh, but more importantly, I think people the length and breadth of Scotland, including in our island uh, communities, will draw their own conclusions uh, from the approach the Conservatives take to these issues. Uh, Jenny Minto, who of course uh, represents in this Parliament a number of islands, is absolutely right. The award of these contracts is uh, good news for islanders and island communities, and that's why it's important uh, that they are progressing well. I understand there will be an update on steel cutting uh, and key laying expected in the coming days. So we will continue uh, to take decisions that are in the interest of those uh, living in our island communities, such as the decision we're talking about right now. Question number six, Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of the extension of bus fare caps in England, whether the Scottish Government supports capping bus fares in Scotland for those aged between 22 and 60. First Minister. Well, I think the first thing to point out is that Scotland uh, already has the most generous concessionary fare scheme in the UK. Uh, more than 2.3 million people in Scotland are eligible not for capped bus fares, but for free bus travel in Scotland. Uh, we, of course, continue to develop and assess options to create a fairer and more transparent system of fares to maintain and increase affordability for those who do need it. And that is exactly why we're progressing the fair fares review. That review is considering cost and availability of services and the range of discounts and concessionary schemes available on all modes, including bus, rail and ferry. Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The maximum cost of a single bus fare in London is £1.65. In this city, in Edinburgh, it is £1.85. In Manchester, Liverpool and West Yorkshire, where Labour mayors have taken control over transport, it is £2. It is £2 in Cardiff, and now it is £2 in every part of England for the next few months. Yet in Greater Glasgow, it can be as much as £2.65 for just a £2 mile journey. We really don't need a fares fair review to tell us that's not fair. It's time, it's time to cap fares and greater public control of buses and for a bit of urgency. In a cost of living crisis, why are people in Scotland paying amongst the highest bus fares in the UK? First Minister. Well, of course, what Neil, Neil uh, Bibby omits to say in that question is people over 60 don't pay anything at all uh, for yeah. bus travel, which I think is replicated in other parts of the UK. But in Scotland, uh, nobody under age 22 yeah. pays for bus travel either. Yeah. It is not capped. It is free. 2.3 million people across our country eligible for completely free bus travel. Now, in terms of the question of capping costs uh, for those who do pay, it is right that we progress any proposal like that through the Fair Fares uh, Review so that we properly consider cost and availability of services and uh, the, the whole range of discounts and concessionary schemes that are already available. So that's exactly uh, what we will continue to do. But let me uh, say yet again, because I think it's a fantastic statistic uh, and reality, presiding officer, 2.3 million people in Scotland don't pay anything at all, don't pay a single penny to travel by bus in Scotland. Thank you. We'll move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Christine Graham. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I'm referencing the exchanges on the pressures on the NHS. And while I understand that there are some 2 million people have access to the flu vaccine, 90% or so, when they were getting their winter COVID booster, uh, is there more that can be done for those eligible to access this? This flu is very, very serious indeed. First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, uptake uh, levels for both COVID and flu vaccines uh, are high, and uh, that's to be welcomed. Uh, but we will continue to promote uh, vaccine uptake uh, for those who are eligible but haven't already been vaccinated. And uh, we will, of course, uh, think most carefully about those in the most vulnerable groups. Uh, but if we look at older care home residents uh, in Scotland, uh, these are uh, figures, uh, I think, for the first week in January, uh, almost 90 
per cent vaccinated, which is higher than both England and Wales for those over 50, 77 uh, per cent are vaccinated, again higher uh, than other parts of the UK. But we will continue to work hard to encourage everybody who is eligible for a vaccine uh, to take up that eligibility. Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister is more than aware of the crisis facing the NHS. Last week, a whistleblower got in contact from the Accident Emergency Department within the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy, expressing their concerns that patients were waiting for over nine hours to be seen and that patient examinations were being conducted in the ambulances in the hospital grounds. Staff within the department believed a major incident criteria was met but were not allowed to call or declare it as such. So can the First Minister confirm that no political direction was given to NHS Fife or any other health board for that matter to ensure that a major incident was not called? And will she agree to investigate why staff were not allowed to follow standard protocol? Yeah. First Minister. I uh, said on Monday, in fact, the Health Secretary has uh, confirmed uh, this to health boards in writing this week, that it is up to health boards, you know, seeking advice and guidance from government where they think that is appropriate, but it is up to health boards to take whatever decisions uh, they think uh, might be appropriate to prioritise critical and, and life-saving care. Uh, in fact, Douglas Ross uh, actually started his questioning to me today uh, by criticising the fact that Greater Glasgow and Clyde have effectively done that by pausing uh, non-urgent uh, oh, care in, in Glasgow. Come on, so come on, the, the action... Excuse me, First Minister. Members must treat one another with stop. courtesy and respect. And I would appreciate it if there could be no interruptions at the moment. Continue, First Minister. So, in a sense, the, the point I'm making, Presiding Officer, the Action Greater Glasgow and Clyde announced last night demonstrates uh, that health boards have the flexibility where they think that is necessary uh, to take that action, and that is right and proper. Jackie Bailey. The fatal accident inquiry into the tragic fire at Cameron House Hotel more than five years ago reported yesterday, and I want to thank the Sheriff and the Lord Advocate for their assistance in getting to this point. The report included a range of recommendations designed to prevent this from happening again. Will the First Minister give a commitment today that all recommendations will be implemented as a matter of the utmost urgency, and will she also consider whether the Fire Brigade require further enforcement powers as both Cameron House and the more recent fire at the New County Hotel in Perth appear to have been warned of fire risks but did nothing about them. First Minister. Uh, firstly, in relation to the FEI report that was published uh, yesterday, I'm also very grateful to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service for their work uh, on this extremely important fatal accident inquiry and for publication of the report. Um, let me also uh, mark my thanks again to the emergency services for their response on the night of the fire and, of course, my condolences again uh, to those bereaved in this incident. Uh, of course, we will thoroughly consider all of the Sheriff's recommendations. I would expect that, yes, we will accept all of the recommendations uh, but we have to go through a process of considering them properly and we're required to, spawn, to respond to these in due course uh, and we will do that. In terms of enforcement, I, I think in light of Cameron House and indeed uh, the more recent incident in Perth and uh, my condolences uh, go to the bereaved uh, in that incident as well. I think it would be right uh, that uh, there is a, a look at enforcement provisions. Uh, under the Fire Scotland Act 2005, uh, the for Fire Service are appointed as the enforcing authority for fire in Scotland uh, and as part of uh, that they produce all relevant enforcement procedures while applying the principles contained within the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code uh, of Practice. As the enforcing authority, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service work with duty holders in relevant premises to achieve compliance in fire safety through providing advice and support and, where necessary, taking enforcement action. Uh, so these uh, systems are set out uh, very clearly, uh, but of course as part of our consideration of the recommendations of the Sheriff, uh, we will ensure that all appropriate aspects of this uh, are looked at in an appropriate way. Paul McLennan. The Tory UK Government continues to show contempt for workers with their proposed anti-trade union legislation. Does the First Minister share my concern about the impact which these plans could have on the rights of people working in devolved public services? And will she join me in condemning and opposing this brazen attack on trade union rights? First Minister. This is a really important 
issue, presenting officer, the UK government, I think it's important to make this point, already has the most anti-trade union laws yeah. in Western Europe. Uh, but this bill threatens to undermine and weaken the rights of workers uh, even further. Uh, we strongly, strongly oppose any bill that undermines uh, trade union, legitimate trade union activity um, and doesn't respect fair work principles. Um, I think as governments we should be working with the public sector and with trade unions to reach fair and reasonable settlements respecting the legitimate interests of workers, uh, not trying to pour fuel on uh, fires or take away uh, workers' democratic uh, rights. And these will be points I make very strongly uh, when I see the Prime Minister later this evening. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Gorgie City Farm, which gives volunteering opportunities to disadvantaged young people and adults, as well as providing a wonderful green uh, play space and learning space in one of the most urban parts of the capital, is due to close on Monday. Now, I know the First Minister will be aware of the incredible value which this community facility provides, as she's previously uh, visited one of Scotland's last urban farms. So can I ask the First Minister what emergency support could be made available to help keep the farm going in an interim period? period. And will ministers also agree to meet with myself, council and local campaigners to discuss a way forward to save the farm? First Minister. Firstly, I, I have visited uh, Gorgie Farm, so I'm very well aware of, of the excellent work uh, that it, it does and its real value uh, to the community and I think to Scotland as a whole. Uh, of course, if there are uh, any uh, reasonable steps the government could take uh, to support a way forward, we would certainly consider uh, doing that. And I will uh, ask the relevant minister uh, to meet with the member of the council uh, and representatives uh, of the farm if that would uh, be helpful and appropriate uh, to consider any options uh, for the future. So I, I will ask that that is taken forward uh, with all due haste. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. A mother in my constituency has provided me with data showing that this year, for many courses at the University of Edinburgh outside of very welcome widening access places, there were zero Scots admitted. For Scottish pupils from ordinary families and an average school, the doors are closed, no matter their mind or their endeavour. For 440 years, the University of Edinburgh has admitted among the best and brightest of Scotland Walter Scott, Catherine Granger, Stuart MacDonald, Robert Louis Stevenson, Joanna Cherry. All great minds who worked hard and gained entry to study law here in our capital city. With funding frozen for 13 years, presiding officer, and the SNP's cap on Scottish students, the historic promise of a Scottish education is broken. After five centuries, First Minister, how has it come to this? First Minister. I'm, I'm actually, for reasons... Uh, that I'll come on to. I'm actually quite, uh, forgive me if this is not parliamentary language, President Officer, I'm actually quite gobsmacked that that question has been put in that way by a Labour <laughs> member of Parliament. Wow. Let me first of all uh, give these facts. Um, a record, record uh, number of uh, young people secured places at university in this latest UCAS cycle. A record number of 18-year-old Scots uh, have secured a university place, um, up 20% since 2019, the last year there were exams. Uh, and the data, yes, provides a really, really positive story for those applying from deprived areas. 18-year-olds securing places from the most deprived areas uh, have increased by 31% since the 2019 uh, cycle and all aged acceptances from the most deprived areas are up by 4%. Uh, percent. I, and this is where I take issue with Michael Mara. Um, in my earlier days as First Minister, I used to be regularly criticised for the fact that there were too few uh, young people from deprived communities going to university. Now I appear to be being criticised for the fact that there are too many yeah. uh, going yeah. to yeah. university. Yeah. You know, 30. I, I didn't. I don't. I don't come from a deprived background. I come from a working class background. I went to a state school. When I studied law at Glasgow University, I was very much in the minority. So I think it is really good news within a context of a record number of young Scots at university. I think it's really good news that we're seeing more from the most deprived areas actually going to our universities. And Maggie Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. The First Minister will be very aware that there are people from Tory and other Aberdeen campaigners here today. They are angry that they face losing their community's last remaining green space, St Fittick's Community Park. 
Torrey contains the most concentrated area of multiple deprivation in the north of Scotland. Losing St Fittix will be detrimental for residents' health and well-being and bad for wider social and environmental justice. Will the First Minister support Torrey residents and others' calls to save the park for, for current and future generations by using powers under the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 to ensure St Fittix is not rezoned for, de for development? First Minister. Well, I know there is very strong feeling on this issue. However, Aberdeen City Council have notified ministers of their intention to adopt the local development plan and ministers uh, will now consider this. As part of our scrutiny, we will consider uh, previous Scottish Government recommendations and check on whether reporters' modifications have been fully translated into the modified uh, plan. And, of course, ministers will set out a decision in due course. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I note the First Minister referenced live data uh, when talking about the current delayed discharge situation. Uh, and as, as far as I'm aware, the live, da that live data is not public. Uh, the Office for Statistics Regulation has made clear that when information is used to publicly inform Parliament, it should be published in an accessible form. Uh, so can I ask the presiding officer uh, if she will uh, seek the First Minister to make a commitment uh, to publishing that as soon as possible? Yes, thank you, Mr Burnett. That is not a matter for the Chair, um, but your comments are on the record. There will be a brief pause before we move on. There will be a brief suspension before we move on to members' business.